persons having anything to do before the Honorable, the Justices of the Supreme Judicial Court, now sitting in Boston, the Women's Father Commonwealth, draw near, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Court is now open. Please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kimberly Budd, and on behalf of the Justices of the Supreme Judicial Court, I am pleased to welcome you to this memorial sitting for the Honorable Chief Justice Ralph Dreyfus Gantz. September 14th was the second anniversary of Chief Justice Gantz's sudden and unexpected passing. Ordinarily, we would have had this ceremony well before now, but as many of you know, we decided to postpone it until the COVID-19 pandemic had eased to the point at which we could have at least a hybrid ceremony with at least some guests able to be here in person. We so appreciate all of you who are here in the courtroom, as well as those of you who are joining us remotely. We're here to celebrate the life and legacy of a great jurist and a great human being. I want to especially welcome the family of Chief Justice Gantz including his wife, Professor Deborah Ramirez, and their children, Michael and Rachel, and his brother, Fred Gantz. We are also glad to welcome here today the many colleagues and friends of Chief Justice Gantz, including former Chief Justices Margaret Marshall and Rick Ireland, as well as retired SJC Justices Judy Cowan and Margot Botsford. I also want to welcome retired Chief Justice of the Trial Court, Paula Carey, and Chief Justice Mark Green, and Justices and staff of the Appeals Court, Chief Justice Jeff Locke, Court Administrator John Bayo, all of the trial, trial court chiefs of the trial court departments, and all of the current and former justices of the trial court. <coughs> I also want to welcome uh, former Governor Weld, U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins, Senator Jamie Eldridge, and members of the Governor's Council in attendance today. And last but not least, we welcome the former law clerks of Chief Justice Gantz. As it turns out, today is Chief Justice Gantz's birthday. He would have been 68. <coughs> and that's a stark reminder that he, is that he was taken from us far too soon. But it's also fitting for us to gather together on this day to honor him and to reflect on how his wisdom and warmth continue to guide and inspire us today. This afternoon's speakers will describe how Chief Justice Gantz brought extraordinary qualities of heart and mind to everything that he did, combining keen intellect with profound empathy, endless energy, and great good humor. I, like so many of you, feel fortunate to, to be able to say that he was both a mentor from whom I learned so much and a dear friend. So let's begin. The court now recognizes Attorney General Maura Healy. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. Maura Healy, Attorney General on behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it is my honor to present on behalf of the Bar of the Commonwealth, a memorial and tribute to the late Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. Chief Justice Gantz served the Supreme Judicial Court with great distinction from January 2009 until his death in September 2020. First as an associate justice and then for more than six years as Chief Justice. He also served for more than 11 years as an associate justice of the Superior Court. 
Chief Justice Budd, Justice Gaziano, Justice Lowy, Justice Seifer, Justice Kapker, Justice Wendland, Justice Georges. It is truly an honor to appear, to appear before you today as we recognize and celebrate the distinguished life and career of Chief Justice Gantz. It is an honor to be here with so many well-respected members of our legal community. I also would like to recognize members of Chief Justice Gantz's family who are here with us today, including his wife, Deborah Ramirez, his brother, Fred Gantz, as well as his children who are with us in spirit, Rachel Ramirez Gantz and Michael Ramirez Gantz, as well as many friends and other family. We come together today to pay tribute to Chief Justice Gantz, a brilliant justice known for his keen intellect, wellspring of compassion, and deep commitment to access to justice. Chief Justice Gantz was born in New Rochelle, New York in 1954 to Helene Dreyfus Gantz and Gustav Gantz. A graduate of both Harvard College and Harvard Law School, Chief Justice Gantz also received a diploma in criminology at Cambridge University in England and was awarded an honorary doctor of law degrees from New England Law and the University of Massachusetts School of Law. Chief Justice Gantz launched his legal career as a law clerk to United States District Court Judge Eugene H. Nickerson. He then served as a special assistant to FBI Director William H. Webster. Chief Justice Gantz later served as an assistant U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts and Chief of the Public Corruption Unit. He then joined the Boston law firm, formerly known as Palmer and Dodge, and he practiced law there until Governor William Weld appointed him to the Superior Court in 1997. Chief Justice Gantz served for over 11 years with distinction as an Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court, and in 2008, was Administrative Justice of the Superior Court's Business Litigation Session. In 2009, Governor Deval Patrick appointed him to the Supreme Judicial Court. And in 2014, Ralph D. Gantz became the 37th Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. And he was sworn in by Governor Patrick. In addition to being a mentor, Chief Justice Gantz was also a teacher, having taught at Harvard Law School, New England Law, and Northeastern University School of Law. He also served on the Board of Directors of the Conference of Chief Justices, where he chaired the Access and Fairness Committee. Chief Justice Gantz was the recipient of numerous honors and awards including the 2016 Haskell Cohn Award for Distinguished Judicial Service, the 2017 Massachusetts Bar Foundation Great Friend of Justice Award, and the Bar Boston Bar Association Citation of Judicial Excellence, and the Suffolk Law School Public Service Award, to name a few. Beyond his numerous academic and professional accolades, however, many colleagues remember Chief Justice Gantz for the depth of his commitment to access to justice. As Chief Justice Margaret Marshall recalled, Chief Justice Gantz, quote, cared passionately about the interests of the public, especially people who needed to have access to the courts. His interest was always with the public. He asked, are the courts serving the public? That meant litigators, lawyers, and people who went to the court to obtain justice. He served as co-chair of the Access to Justice Commission and advocated for equity and expanded legal representation for the most vulnerable in our communities, calling for a right to counsel in eviction proceedings and for a statewide expansion of the housing court. He continued his work to stem the tide of evictions and displacement resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, which he considered, quote, the greatest access to justice challenge of our lifetime, right through the day he died. Chief Justice Gantz cared deeply about the future of the judiciary and the future of the criminal justice system, challenging the wisdom of mandatory minimum sentences and eyewitness identification procedures. 
former Harvard Law School Dean Martha Minow described him as, quote, fearless about facing historic injustices. In 2016, Chief Gantz partnered with Dean Minow and commissioned a study of racial disparities in our state courts. The completed study, released just days before Chief Justice Gantz's death in 2020, demonstrated that black and Hispanic or Latin defendants received longer sentences than white defendants. It found that they, are, that they were disproportionately represented as defendants before our criminal courts. At every turn, Chief Justice Gantz focused on how the legal system affects people's lives. He consistently worked to expand access to justice and racial equity. And like many of you, I remember him as a person of true vision, kindness, and empathy. In 2015, when I took the oath of Attorney General, it was Chief Justice Gantz who administered that oath at my swearing in. I was grateful to approach the podium together with a person whom I had long admired for his faithfulness to the Constitution and to serving people. It is with great fondness and deep appreciation for his service and his commitment to justice for all that we remember Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. Chief Justice Gantz occupies and will forever occupy a special place in our hearts and in the history of this great court. On behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I respectfully move that this memorial be spread on the records of the Supreme Judicial Court. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General. The court now recognizes Professor Harold Coe. <laughs> Madam Chief Justice, may it please the court, Harold Hongju Ko, on behalf of the bar, thank you for allowing me to appear here for this day only as a member of the Massachusetts Bar. In my defense, let me plead. I was born in Massachusetts. I lived and studied here for 13 years. And like Chief Justice Gantz, I'm a loyal citizen of Red Sox Nation. <laughs> But my main qualification for being here today is that Ralph Gantz was more than my friend. He was my <clears throat> brother in the law. I first met Ralph 50 years ago when his big brother, Fred, met my big brother, Howard, at Yale, where I now teach. We met again at Harvard College and became close friends and classmates at Harvard Law School, from which we graduated in 1980. Ralph and I and two other Dear friends, Scott Gilbert and Larry Too, formed a close quartet who led parallel lives in the law. As our lives unfolded, we stayed together. We attended each other's weddings, family events. We talked often by phone. We had our last Zoom call together the morning before Ralph passed, just after he had suffered what we assumed was a mild heart attack. On those calls, Ralph always asked about us, and was self-deprecating about himself. On that last call, I asked Ralph, how are you doing? He answered, rebuilding, like the Red Sox. <laughs> Incredibly, the next day, he was gone. From the very beginning, Ralph could think clearly, write beautifully, and unravel the toughest problems to reach the best answers. At Harvard College, he was known for his understated brilliance, gentle wit, and good humor. A scholarship student and summa cum laude graduate in economics, he had been student council president of his high school in Larchmont, New York. A fine athlete, he was universally liked. He did not come from privilege. His loving parents, Gustav and Helene, were warm, honest, generous, and welcoming. They gave Ralph and his brother lifelong lessons in what intelligence, hard work, and humanity can achieve. Ralph won a prestigious fellowship to Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, and returned to Harvard Law School, where his work on the Law Review distinguished him, even among young lawyers who would later become university presidents, judges, ambassadors, deans and professors, corporate CEOs and general counsel, and a future Chief Justice of the United States. 
Yet even at that time, Ralph was unusual for his acute awareness of how his decisions could affect human lives. As fledgling lawyers, we moved to Washington to live together as roommates when Ralph began working as special assistant to FBI Director William Webster. One night I asked him about something I assumed he was working on. He said calmly, if I answered that, I might get someone killed. <laughs> <laughs> but even as his professional trajectory soared, his personal qualities never varied. He remained kind, thoughtful, and humble, and maintained his good humor, and his most special gift, friendship. If something was important to you, it was important to Ralph. He would travel miles to friends' weddings and kids' bat mitzvahs, always turning the spotlight on everyone else. If a friend needed help, he gave it, no question asked. When my parents came to town to meet Christy, then my new girlfriend for decades now, my wife, Ralph drove the four of us around all weekend in his new stick shift car. I later learned he had never before driven a <laughs> stick shift car. And at one point, our backseat conversation stalled when we realized the car had stalled <laughs> in an intersection on Constitution Avenue with cars coming from all directions. When the weekend ended, I, I thanked Ralph for driving. He shrugged and said, friends should do things for friends, especially when things just have to go well. <laughs> After Washington, Ralph moved to Boston as assistant U.S. attorney where he became one of the leading public corruption prosecutors in the country, pursuing cases of highest sensitivity with stunning success. He won headlines for his handling of the Jerry Indelicado case, the prosecution of the former Lowell city manager, and the conviction of Malden police officers who had extorted payoffs. In 1991, Ralph moved to Palmer and Dodge and emerged as one of Boston's leading trial attorneys. His commitment to social justice led him to do donate countless hours to indigents. In one case, he appeared alone to win acquittal of a Scottish immigrant caught up in claims of corporate fraud. He represented pro bono, a Mariel Cuban who had challenged his ordered return to Cuba, and an HIV positive Massachusetts prisoner who had been denied appropriate medical care in the facility to which he was transferred. Ralph often became what Justice Brandeis called the lawyer for the situation. On one occasion, Harvard Law School asked him to handle a delicate internal investigation involving faculty and students. On another, the court assigned him the difficult, sensitive task of prosecuting a Massachusetts district judge on behalf of the Judicial Conduct Commission. Through it all, Ralph spent more than a decade teaching at Northeastern, Harvard, and New England School of Law, courses on criminal procedure, government lawyering, and balancing security and liberty. He built bridges between the bench, bar, and academy of the kind first constructed here by Bob Browker, Ben Kaplan, Margie Marshall, and Nancy Gertner. Following his appointment by Governor Weld to the bench, Ralph became known as one of the most respected judges on the Massachusetts trial and appellate bench. His lower court decisions were remarkably well-researched, ranging across complex issues of public and private law, whether unpacking complex issues of science, administration, and environmental law to sustain a challenge to the environmental impact statement for Boston University's biolab, reconceptualizing tortious interference with contractual relations, creating a test for the fairness of subprime loans, reviewing dram shop liability or complex statutory issues about savings bank life insurance, or clarifying the standard of review to be applied to self-dealing uh, decisions by a corporate board of directors. I per personally witnessed one measure of his universal respect in 2005 during a famous episode known here as Ballgate. <laughs> When the Red Sox won the World Series in 2004, a dispute arose between the team and a former player concerning who owned the historic baseball that was used in the final curse breaking out. I suggested to Red Sox president Larry Lucchino that the team secure the patrimony of Red Sox nation by filing a quasi in rem lawsuit against the ball <laughs> for possession and title. 
When they did that, the case was assigned, of course, to Judge Gantz of the business litigation section. As co-counsel, I told the Red Sox lawyers they should advise the judge that his former roommate was on the case. They worried that he might recuse himself and frankly probably hoped that I would get off. But after the hearing, I waited with bated breath to hear what Ralph had done. My co-counsel said Judge Gantz had opened the hearing by disclosing our friendship at length. He then entertained any motions the lawyers might want to file. So what happened next? Nothing. Neither side moved to recuse because all sides wanted the smartest, fairest judge possible, and everybody agreed that was Judge Gantz. From the beginning, Ralph felt for the underdog. He instinctively understood the perspective of the little guy. His faith in human goodness fueled his belief that given the chance, underdogs like our Red Sox would eventually rise to the occasion. His passion was fueled by the love of his life, Deborah Ramirez, who he met, courted, and married as fellow assistant U.S. attorneys before she went on to become a path-breaking professor. As a couple, they became a source of wisdom and inspiration for many, and Debbie continues their life project in so many ways today. As the spouse of a civil rights lawyer, Ralph came to understand the concerns of minorities and women seeking equal access to power. Around the family table, they talk daily about the practical challenges of meaningful justice, transmitting to Rachel and Michael their determination to wait, make the world a more just and equal place. So when Governor Patrick first appointed him to the bench and then elevated him to be chief, he broke the mold twice, not just by appointing the Commonwealth's first Jewish chief justice, but by naming a chief who would view litigants' problems from the perspective of the most marginalized among us. As he rose through the courts, Ralph's desire to build true justice became more urgent. Especially as chief, he always managed to look at the world from your perspective. His second sight allowed him to empathize with those <coughs> of different races and upbringings. Those at the margins of justice, he felt a deep connection to. So when Massachusetts struggled with the treatment of people of color, those with disabilities and LGBTQ individuals, he demanded equity and inclusion. When Donald Trump targeted Muslims, Ralph visited mosques to explain why we're all part of one America. As chief, Ralph was a giraffe, a visionary who kept his feet on the ground, but his head above the clouds. He had an extraordinary capacity to think about the present and future at the same time, always finding time to look up from today's work to contemplate tomorrow's problems. Just flip through the pages of the November 2021 edition of the Boston College Law Review to review the many articles chronicling his leadership in so many different areas of the law. His unusual foresightedness led him to see problems before crises hit, whether the eviction moratorium or the need to focus proactively on attorneys' mental health. At his first investiture, he reminded us of what his first boss, Judge Eugene Nickerson, told him as a law clerk. We can't make this whole world fair, but we can and must do everything we can to make our small piece of the world a place where justice ru rules. So when asked about the coming of online courts, he saw ahead of his time and saw, thought first about human needs, emphasizing the importance of making sure that no one would be put at a disadvantage because of issues of education, language access, or other concerns. Which brings us to today. So many in our public life disappoint us. So many of our leaders have feet of clay. What Ralph's story tells us is in America we do still have heroes, and one of them was this modest, exceptional man who left us decades too early. So in the end, aren't we who knew him the lucky ones? I was blessed to have him as a friend for 45 years and to see up close what a mensch looks like. As our life unfolded, we'd call each other about once a month, sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for an hour. He was never too busy to talk, and we talked about things other than law. But as time passed, it dawned on me 
that Ralph had become one of the finest judges of his generation. Paul McCartney recently recalled, all the time I was working with this guy called John. Now I look back and I realize I was working with John Lennon. For me, I was just rooming with this guy named Ralph. <laughs> but now I look back and all along I was learning from Chief Justice Gantz. When speaking about his friends, he would say, there might be better people in the world. I don't know if I've met them yet. Well, there might be a better friend in the world, but I know I will not meet them. That he was taken from us so early, I cannot forgive. But in my heart, I always talk to him, and he challenges me still. As roommates, we used to talk late into the night about the problems of the world. One night before we went to sleep, we made each other a promise. If, when we grew up, we ever reached positions of influence, we would do everything in our power to make the world a fairer place. Ralph, I came here today to tell you, as a judge, a lawyer, a friend, you kept your promise. The question is, will we keep ours? Madam Chief Justice, on behalf of members of the bar, I move to support the Attorney General's motion. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Coe. We'll now hear from one of the Chief's former law clerks, Gavin Alexander. May it please the court, Gavin Alexander, Wellness Director of Jackson Lewis and member of the SJC Standing Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing here on behalf of Chief Justice Gantz's former law clerks. Good afternoon, Justices, Attorney General and Democratic gubernatorial nominee Healy, Professor Coe, members of the Gantz and Ramirez families, lawyers and legal professionals and judges of all levels, friends, colleagues, and anyone who may be reading these remarks in the future. I speak today so that all of you may know Chief Justice Ralph D. Gantz as I knew Chief Justice Ralph D. Gantz. During the 2012 to 2013 court year, I had the honor, the privilege, and the absolute pleasure of serving as law clerk to Chief Justice Gantz. Over the course of that year, I grew to know him as a jurist, a mentor, and most importantly, as a friend. The following year, he asked me to participate in the process which saw him elevated from Associate Justice to Chief Justice, first by writing a letter of recommendation in support of his candidacy to Governor Deval Patrick's Chief Legal Counsel, who I see over there, um, and second by testifying at his confirmation hearing. Then, in 2015, Chief Justice Gantz officiated my wedding to my partner, Angelo. Since then, the Chief and I stayed in touch consistently meeting for lunch or dinner once every few months to discuss policy, politics, or the ways we could leverage each of our respective experiences and positions to affect positive legal change in the profession and the systems of justice in the Commonwealth. I am humbled to be the one standing here giving these remarks on behalf of Chief Justice Gantz's former law clerks. However, I'm certain that what I will share today is reflective of each of our experiences. In fact, his clerks from every year since 2010 joined a Zoom call only a day or two after his passing to discuss our memories and share our stories. As anyone who's read his opinions or argued before him knows, Justice Gantz was staggeringly brilliant. His analytical ability was nothing short of breathtaking. In a shockingly short amount of time, he could wrap his mind around the most complicated legal conundrum, factual puzzle, or contested point of policy and develop a response that was not only coherent, but often more fair and efficient than any of the arguments even previously put forth. Beyond his astounding judicial acumen, among, among the most surprising things I discovered as I began my clerkship were Justice Gantz's humility and approachability. As a recent graduate of law school, I assumed a justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court would be an imposing figure who made those around him feel the weight of his authority. While Justice Gantz absolutely assumed the mantle of an authorita authoritative figure when the need arose, far more commonly, he was a friendly, considerate, and tremendously enjoyable person. His jokes were 
often <laughs> terrible, <laughs> but always hilarious. <laughs> and he spoke to those around him as not as subordinates, but as friends and respected colleagues. As an example of this, while many of the other justices of the SJC hosted a brown bag lunch for the law clerks in the SJC's dining room, Justice Gantz typically invited the entire class of law clerks for a summer barbecue at his home, where he personally grilled up a meal for everyone. If you speak to anyone who ever got to work for Chief Justice Gantz in the past, or to anyone who got to know him on a personal level, one of the most common traits that will arise in such conversations is his kindness. Justice Gantz went out of his way to care for those around him and to develop positive relationships with everyone, from fellow judges to legislators to law clerks to court support staff and to members of various bar associations and community organizations. Once, after he and I stayed at the court past midnight working on an unpublished single justice opinion, <laughs> Justice Gantz insisted on personally driving me all the way home to Cambridge despite the trip being well out of his way. Justice Gantz's exceptional ability to develop positive relationships with everyone around him while still maintaining the authority and integrity of his office allowed him to build strong bridges with those in the executive and legislative branches as well as those in the community at large. The chief's longtime assistant, Kathy McGinnis, asked me to add the following, quote, the chief was a passionate baseball fan, having played on his town's Flint Park All-Stars youth baseball team, Little League, Babe Ruth League, and on the Mamarneck High School Tigers baseball team. <laughs> I will never forget seeing Ch Chief Justice Gantz on the mound during a Red Sox baseball game at Fren Fenway Park, throwing out the first pitch, while the SJC staff, friends, and 30,000 fans cheered. <laughs> of course the chief threw it right down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> we were so proud of him. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Justice Gantz had a phenomenal ability to discuss disagreements respectfully and openly, to truly listen to others in such situations, and to work with those with whom he may have initially disagreed to reach a fair, reasoned, and optimal outcome. When I interviewed with Justice Gantz for the job of, as his clerk, the first question I asked him was, if I disagree with you, what should I do? I will never forget his response. Justice Gantz smiled at me. You all know that little smile with the curve of his mouth. And he told me that if I were his law clerk, he would consider it my first and foremost job responsibility to speak my mind and let him know if I thought he was getting something wrong. He may have regretted that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but he lived up to that answer every day. During my year as his law clerk, we would often argue issues out together. I would tell him why I disagreed and with a, cer uh, with, with a certain line of analysis, and then we'd engage in an honest and completely respectful discussion about the issue. He was always open to hearing my thoughts. And after talking things through, we would always arrive at an outcome with which we were both happy. His ability to articulate his positions clearly and respectfully while engaging in conversation that made any supposed adversary feel heard. And while sincerely trying, if possible, to arrive at an outcome that was satisfactory to all was unparalleled. Beyond both his judicial acumen and his ability to work with others, he brought his passion and dedication to bear by seeking to understand the flaws in our broken systems that lead to oppression, discrimination, and injustice, and by uniting the most passionate advocates around him to develop meaningful and practical solutions that would actually change the very way the law operates for the better. Years before the killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and others finally centered racial injustice in the public spotlight, Chief Justice Gantz had already turned his attention toward systemic oppression and racial discrimination in the legal system. In 2015, Ralph Gantz, the first Jewish Chief Justice in the court's 300-year history, spoke at New England's largest mosque, where he told the Islamic congregants, quote, you do not stand alone. You have a constitution and laws to protect your right to practice your religion, to protect you from discrimination and the denial of your equal rights, and to protect you from acts of violence that might be committed because of your religion or your nation of origin." End quote. Highlighting the history of discrimination that has infected our country since its founding, he noted that in that very same speech that, quote, during the Depression, Mexican Americans were scapegoated for the economic deprivation that they did not cause. 
and more than two million Americans were deported, unquote. And that, quote, the forefathers of African Americans came to this country in chains, and we are still challenged by the legacy of slavery and of Jim Crow, end quote. Following up on that sentiment, in 2016, again years before the racial reckoning of 2020 and beyond, he commissioned Harvard Law School's Criminal Justice Policy Program to conduct a data-driven study that he hoped would highlight the precise ways in which racial discrimination infects criminal justice. The result of this study, a 100-page report titled Racial Disparities in the Massachusetts Criminal System, was released to the public less than a week before his death. I can think of no more appropriate final gift from him to the world. More personally, Chief Justice Gantz was the first legal professional to whom I ever admitted that I was suffering from severe depression and had come seconds away from killing myself while practicing. We were sitting down over dinner and he asked me how things were going. Unlike so many others who asked me that question, I couldn't hide it from him. I felt like I needed to tell him the truth because he had never done anything but the same to me. I honestly can't even describe how perfect his response was. He told me he was there for me and that he would do anything I asked him to do to support me. However, beyond this, he immediately began working with me to brainstorm meaningful ways in which I could continue the practice I found rewarding without my mind suffering to such an extreme degree and discussing ways in which I could share my story and advocate for improved mental health in the legal profession as a whole. As with racial justice, immigration justice, access to justice, and so many other forms of justice that he tried to improve, he was also a stalwart, forward-thinking, and dedicated advocate for well-being in law. After our initial conversation, we continued discussing my experiences with mental health and the practice of law, and eventually, when the SJC, under the leadership of Chief Justice Gantz and retired Justice Margot Botsford, convened its initial 2018 steering committee on lawyer well-being, he asked me if I'd be comfortable sharing my experiences in front of a plenary session of the entire committee and all of its subcommittees. I accepted, and that day, sharing my story so publicly and so authentically was one of the most significant turning points in my career and in my life. I felt like the entire stigma I'd felt, the need to hide away this shameful weakness in my resiliency, had been utterly destroyed, and instead, through Chief Justice Gantz's guidance and support, I had reclaimed one of my deepest struggles and channeled it into advocacy. Without even realizing it, Justice Gantz had paved my path not only to recovery, but to fighting to make the world and the legal profession safer, more inclusive, more sustainable, and more rewarding. And that, in my mind, is really the crux of his heroism and legacy. Far beyond his brilliant jurisprudence or even his own zealous advocacy, Chief Justice Gantz had the almost magical abilities, first to turn anyone into an advocate for justice, and second, to then bring those advocates together in constructive ways to affect actual, meaningful, practical, and real change. On September 14th, 2020, my hero and my friend died. Justice Gantz was the best supervisor I ever had, the most incredible lawyer I have ever met, and without exaggeration, the best person I have personally known. He is gone, but his impact will last forever through the advocates he created and inspired and united. We are his legacy. And we will not stop until we see justice realized in ways he'd only begun to imagine, where those without the privileges of wealth, whiteness, mental health, or other privileged status do not, feel, do not live in fear of the law, but feel protected by it. And we'll do so with humility, kindness, respect, approachability, and more than a few bad jokes along the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Alexander. <clears throat> I now ask my colleague, Justice Frank Gaziano, to respond to the pending motion on behalf of the justices and the court. Chief Justice Budd, Justices Lowy, Seifer, Kafka, Wendlet, and Georges, Attorney General Healy, 
Professor Ko, Mr. Alexander, members of the bar, the family of Chief Justice Ralph Gantz and guests. I am truly honored to speak on behalf of the court as we gather to celebrate the legacy of an outstanding and inspirational Chief Justice. I met Ralph about 20 years ago upon my appointment to the Superior Court. Before meeting Ralph, I knew of his stellar reputation in the United States Attorney's Office. Although he had left the office some years earlier, he continued to serve as a role model for a generation of federal prosecutors based upon his fearless prosecution of public corruption cases and his steadfast commitment to strict ethical standards. I also had heard of Ralph's reputation as a, as a Superior Court judge. My former colleagues in the unnamed district attorney's office asked me if I knew this former Fed who had come to the county. <laughs> they expressed dismay over the assignment of this troublemaker <laughs> from out of the county. The problem, as they perceived it, was that Judge Gantz did not blindly adhere to past practices. Nope. He sometimes questioned the legal basis for matters the state prosecutors had deemed routine, if they only knew what was to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Patrick appointed Ralph to the Supreme Judicial Court in 2009. In 2013, I was asked by Chief Justice Marshall to join the Committee on the Model Jury Instructions on Homicide. The committee, chaired by Ralph, was tasked with revising the court's 1999 instructions on homicide. Before the first meeting, I assumed the committee would examine the court's post-1999 homicide jurisprudence, make a few changes to reflect current law. This should not, I naively thought, take that long. <laughs> At the first meeting, Ralph declared that we would, in fact, update the model homicide instructions to conform to existing case law. So far, so good. He then added, they would endeavor to explore incongruities in the law and make appropriate changes. I wondered to myself whether I had mistakenly stumbled into a meeting to revise the Gantz model penal code. <laughs> I expressed my concerns to Ralph. Thus began our long seven-year conversation on Massachusetts homicide law. <laughs> These discussions fostered a great, close working relationship and soon developed into a friendship. His analysis of legal issues was razor sharp and forward thinking. He also appreciated that the committee's goal was to provide practical guidance for trial lawyers and judges to resolve complex issues that arise in these high pressure cases with juries in the box. As a trial judge, I looked forward to reading Ralph's decisions. They were clearly written, well-researched, methodically reasoned, leading to seemingly inevitable conclusions. They also rarely disappointed. The trial court waited to see what hoary, unfair, and practical doctrines of law would fall victim to Ralph's pen. <laughs> Two cases come to mind. In Commonwealth versus Zanetti, Ralph re-examined the 25-year-old Massachusetts formulation of accomplice liability known as joint venture. This term, he later told me, was needlessly confusing because it sounded like a business entity, not a theory of criminal liability. He convinced the court to adopt less confusing terminology and drafted a jury instruction in line with common law concepts of aiding and abetting. In the famous Papadopoulos case, the court abandoned the Massachusetts distinction between natural and unnatural accumulations of ice and snow and premises liability cases. Rejected a 19th century Massachusetts rule that was difficult to apply and had little socially beneficial purpose, Ralph wrote that determinations of liability should rest on general duties of a property owner to use a reasonable care to maintain a property. In 2014, I had the privilege of being appointed to the Supreme Judicial Court. As a member of this court, I was then fully able to appreciate Ralph's brilliance, devotion to the judiciary, and the court family, and unmatched work ethic. 
During that time, Ralph articulated his view that the proper role of a judge is that of a problem solver. In his 2014 State of the Judiciary Address, he said, we in the judiciary increasingly are recognizing that our role is not only to do justice, but to solve problems, and that the sensible resolution of problems is often how we do justice. The next year, he explained what it meant to be a problem solver. He said that it is best described by two principles from the Jewish religious tradition, but probably are shared by nearly every, every religious tradition. The first is that each of us has an obligation to repair the world. The second is that if you save one life, it is as, it is as if you have saved the entire world. In our courts, we seek to repair the world, sometimes even save the world, one person at a time. What parts of the world need to repairing? Ralph focused on many pressing issues faced by vulnerable and marginalized members of our community. To use his words, and as Professor Coe said, it was his obligation, his duty to fight for the little guy. It's impossible in this memorial, in the time I have allotted, to discuss the breadth of Ralph's efforts to fix the world one case at a time. I therefore, I therefore commend to you the 2021 Boston College Law School Symposium that's been mentioned. But I will highlight three issues important to our late Chief Justice. Access to justice, housing justice, and criminal justice reform. So first, access to justice. Improving access to justice for people who cannot afford counsel for their essential civil legal needs was a fundamental concern for Ralph throughout his tenure on the court. In his last State of the Union, uh, State of the Judiciary Address, he noted that he was ever mindful of the many challenges faced by litigants who cannot afford counsel to represent them, who must navigate a complicated legal system and advocate for themselves with no legal training and often with limited English proficiency in cases that can have life-altering consequences, such as eviction from a home, a loss of a child in a custody uh, action. Until we create a world in which all who need counsel in civil cases have access to counsel, he said, we must do all we can to make the court system more understandable and accessible for the many litigants who must represent themselves. And he led efforts to carry out that mission as co-chair of the Access to Justice Commission from 2010 through 2015, and again from 2017 until his death. Under Ralph's leadership at the commission, representatives from the courts, legal aid and social service organizations, the private bar and bar associations, law schools, the business and philanthropic communities worked together to develop many innovative solutions to better meet the needs of unrepresented litigants. They developed a strategic action plan for improving access to justice in the Commonwealth that continues to guide the committee's work today. They successfully advocated for the creation of court service centers in our busiest courts to provide information, assist self-represented litigants in filling out forms. They also envisioned the creation of a virtual court service center that could serve litigants remotely, an idea that certainly proved prescient during the COVID-19 pandemic. They established a pro bono civil appeals clinic, the Access to Justice Fellows Program, which recruits, law, rec recruits retired judges and, and lawyers to share their ex expertise with community organizations serving people of limited means. Beyond its efforts with the Access to Justice Commission, Chief Justice Gantz also worked with the SJC Standing Committee for, on pro bono legal services on initiatives such as creation of, of the pro bono honor roll to recognize and encourage more attorneys, law students, law firms, and other legal organizations to provide volunteer legal assistance to people of limited means. And he regularly spoke at the annual Walk to the Hill event to support increase legislative appropriations for civil legal aid, always coming up with a memorable way to put the funding request in perspective. In his last Walk to the Hill speech, for instance, he observed that the cost of the proposed appropriation per Massachusetts resident was less than the cost of a Dunkin' Donuts breakfast sandwich. <laughs> Ralph also was an important voice for improving access to justice on the national stage through his work with the Access and Fairness Committee of the Conference of Chief Justices 
and conference of state court administrators. As those organizations stated in expressing their condolences after his death, Chief Justice Gantz was a national leader on access to justice issues who cared passionately about the needs of court users who cannot afford counsel and who worked tirelessly and selflessly to ensure that the justice system serve everyone equally and it's accessible to all. Next, housing justice. As a Superior Court judge, Ralph grappled with the fallout of the foreclosure crisis. In Commonwealth versus Fremont, he granted the Attorney General a preliminary injunction restricting a subprime lender's ability to foreclose on loans with certain presumptively unfair features. He found that the Attorney General was likely to prevail on Chapter 93A claim, reasoning that the lender should have recognized the loans were doomed to foreclosure. In 2011, Ralph authored the landmark opinion of Ibanez, U.S. National Bank Association versus Ibanez, addressing the widespread practice of assigning a mortgage retroactively to a successor bank. The court held that a foreclosing entity that is not the original mortgagee is required to show that it was the holder of the mortgage at the time of foreclosure. The 2019 case of Adjutee versus Central Division of the Housing Court was Ralph's housing justice magnum opus. Mm -hmm. It involved claims that the housing court unfairly denied self-represented litigants facing summary process eviction certain procedural protections. Ralph used the case to discuss broad disparities in legal representation between landlords, who often are represented by attorneys, and tenants, who are not. He knew that self-represented litigants face formidable challenges navigating these complex and fast-moving cases. To guide self-represented uh, tenants, he included a 15-page appendix summarizing relevant rules, statutes, and case law, complete with links to housing court forms. The COVID-19 pandemic, as Professor Coe noted, created, in Ralph's words, the greatest access to justice challenge of our lifetime. Indeed, he was working on a solution to the anticipated tsunami of evictions expected to be filed following the expiration of the eviction moratorium on the day of his death. Next is criminal justice reform. Ralph's legacy as a criminal justice reformer grew out of, his several, uh, grew out of several groundbreaking opinions as advocacy against minimum mandatory sentencing. The first area that he wrote on was eyewitness identification. He wrote that eyewitness identification is the greatest source of wrongful convictions, but also an invaluable law enforcement tool in <coughs> obtaining accurate convictions. Ralph authored a series of cases intended to increase the reliability of this powerful evidence. In Commonwealth versus Silva Santiago, Ralph's first published opinion, the court adopted Department of Justice protocols to be employed by law enforcement before a photographic array is shown to a witness. For example, requiring that the witness know it's just as important to clear a person of suspicion as to identify a wrongdoer. Writing for the court in Commonwealth versus Walker, Ralph announced the creation of a study, study group to consider how we can best deter unnecessarily suggestive procedures and whether existing model jury instructions provide adequate guides to jurors evaluating eyewitness testimony. Why this tact of a study group? Ralph explained to committee members that transformational reform of eyewitness identification law would require more than one or two court decisions. It would require rigorous study by a committee comprised of judges, defense attorneys, prosecutors, law professors, and police officers to examine the intersection between the law and science. The committee issued its report in 2013, which included proposed jury instructions to inform jurors about scientific findings uh, uh, related to memory and recall. In Commonwealth versus Gomes, the court approved a modified version of the study group proposal. Ralph turned his attention to in-court identification in Commonwealth versus Creighton and Commonwealth versus Collins. In those cases, the court established a higher level of scrutiny for suggestive first-time in-court identifications. Thereafter, a formerly routine courtroom practice changed. 
to require the government to establish a good reason for the admission of such evidence. Ralph's willingness to revisit established case law in pursuit of justice is exemplified by his decision in two homicide cases, Commonwealth versus Brown and Commonwealth versus Castillo. Prior to Brown and Commonwealth versus Tejeda, Ralph wondered whether our common law of felony murder should continue to be an exception to our basic principles of criminal jurisprudence, or whether we should, whether we should join those who have abolished or redefined felony murder. He answered that question in Commonwealth versus Brown. In that case, he convinced the majority of the justices in a four to three vote to narrow the scope of felony murder by eliminating the widely criticized doctrine of constructive malice. The existing felony murder rule, he reasoned, is unjust because criminal liability is decoupled from moral culpability. Now, you may be curious as to the identity of the dissenter in Commonwealth versus Brown. Mm -hmm. That judge's name escapes me, but you can look it up. <laughs> uh, Commonwealth versus Castillo <laughs> modified the criteria for first degree murder by reasons of extreme atrocity cruelty by placing a greater emphasis on the egregiousness of a defendant's conduct. In addition to writing landmark decisions, Ralph used the power of the bully pulpit to advocate for criminal justice reform. His primary target was the elimination of the one-size-fits-all legislative policy of minimum mandatory sentencing. In the 2014 State of the Judiciary Address, Ralph asked, who would support a sentencing system that ignores the circumstances of the crime, the role of the offender in the commission of that crime, and the background of the defendant? To those who favor the status quo and the so-called war on drugs, I ask you, how well is the status quo working? In 2013, uh, Ralph also testified before the legislature. He said, in 2013, 44% of all persons convicted of drug offenses were persons of color, but 75% of all persons convicted of drug offenses with minimum mandatory sentences were persons of color. If the legislature does not abolish minimum mandatory sentences for drug offenses, it must accept the tragic fact that the disparate treatment of persons of color will be allowed to continue. Later, as mentioned, Ralph commissioned Harvard Law School to research racial disparities in sentencing. He explained, we need to learn the truth of this trouble and disparity. And once we learn it, we need the courage and commitment to handle it. What was it like to work alongside the serious-minded, brilliant problem solver who carried the weight of the world on his shoulders? It was wonderful. <laughs> Ralph was humble, kind, witty, and self-effacing. Unfortunately, I'm ill-equipped to capture the full measure of his charm. I don't have his singing voice, nor know as many show tunes. <laughs> Ralph was an exceptional chief justice and colleague. He patiently presided over consultation, allowing each justice to fully voice his or her own opinion, and massively searched for ways to uh, harmonize divergent views to achieve principled consensus. Ralph also spent an extraordinary amount of time editing draft opinions. I considered it a moral victory whenever his edits were limited to one or two single space, space typewritten pages. <laughs> His suggestions were thoughtful and much appreciated. Whether he clarified one's position, suggested the analysis needed further support, or respectfully disagreed with the ruling. Now, by tradition, the Chief Justice speaks last at Sambal in consultation. Ralph patiently waited his turn, would pause, offer that wry Ralph Gantt smile, and proclaim, well, <laughs> I have a different take on this issue. <laughs> what followed would be a robust discussion where he explored another facet of a case, grateful for his insight. The justices still cherish many quirky Ralphisms. To assign a case, Ralph would politely ask the justice to take his or her hand to the matter. Mm -hmm. Whenever he had to juggle assignments, he would quote gravelly voice Celtics play-by-play -play announcer Johnny Most and tell us the changes were gonna take some fiddling and diddling. 
at the, many, at the end of many intense one, two hour discussions of a case, exhausted, he would sum it up to cheerily proclaim, well that was easy. <laughs> To a proposed solution to a thorny problem, a legal issue, he would say in jest, that's so crazy, it may just work. <laughs> <laughs> and one memorable aside, he described visiting a beautiful country club in Kauai, and then added, it offended his inner Che Guevara. <laughs> uh, my remarks will conclude with a quote from Ralph's beloved spouse, Debbie Ramirez. She said in a Northeastern Symposium, Ralph bent the arc of the moral universe towards justice, one case at a time. We all were blessed to bear witness to the career of an outstanding and transformational jurist. We also are tasked with continuing his legacy to ensure that justice does not forsake the little guy. On behalf of the justices of the Supreme Judicial Court, the motion of the Attorney General is allowed and this memorial is to be spread upon the records of the court. Thank you, Justice Gaziano. That concludes our ceremony, um, but on behalf of my colleagues and the entire court, I thank everyone for being here with us today to share Chief Justice Gant's memory with us. Thanks, too, to the people who made this special sitting possible, including Fran Keneally, Blanca Tosado, Jen Macbeth, Meredith Shee, Jeff Travers and his IT team, and Rob Vitale and his security team. We now welcome you to a reception uh, in the conference suite, because what would a celebration of Ralph be without food? <laughs> the reception is just outside the courtroom to your left. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.